everyone. Thanks to those who came in per person and thank you to those who are online. I'm delighted and honored to introduce Professor Hein de Haas. He's a sociologist and geographer. He's lived in the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and Morocco for an extended period of time. He's coming from the University of Amsterdam, where he's a professor of sociology. And between 2006 and 2015, he was founding member and co-director of the International Migration Institute at the University of Oxford. The International Migration Institute is now a global network of migration scholars who are advancing what we call the Oxford School of Migration. And I'm happy to be part of that. <laughs> Um, really taking a long-term view on migration and seeing it as an intrinsic part of global change and development. Hein's work has really been pioneering and advancing that approach to the study of migration. He is the lead author of The Age of Migration, International Population Movements in the Wo Modern World, which is really kind of the go-to textbook um, in migration studies. And he's also just published a new book uh, called How Migration Works, The Facts About the Most Divisive Issue in Politics. It's now out with Penguin and Basic Books. And we're just so delighted to be able to welcome you here at Duke. Very grateful to the Office of Global Affairs for supporting his visit, as well as the Duke Center for International Development, um, with, who's co-hosting him. And so without further ado, I'm happy to Pass the mic to Professor De Haas. I have a mic here. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here and uh, to be presenting some of the uh, thoughts we have been developing at the International Migration Institute over the last, what is it now, 15, 16 years now, I think. And the idea is really, the idea was from the outset to develop a new paradigm, a new idea, a completely new way of talking about migration. Because it's not just about the facts. I mean, a sort of standard approach amongst many social scientists is, and other scientists. We need facts. We talk to politicians, and they're going to get convinced about how things really are, and then they will change their policies. <laughs> the reality is quite a different one, and particularly migration. because. As we all know, certainly also in the US, but it also counts for the European Union, is this is a highly polarized topic and a very polarized framing in terms of often anti and pro camps. And of course, if we talk about migration, that is a very silly way of discussing the topic because how could you be against or in favor of immigration? It would be almost like asking an economist, or have you ever heard a journalist asking an economist whether he or she is in favor of the economy. And in a way, it's, it already shows how silly that framing is. It doesn't mean that migration can come with its advantages and disadvantages. Of course, it's not a serious way to talk about migration. The problem is that many truths, so-called facts, politicians, mass media, and various in interest groups spread about migration are based on misguided assumptions or myths rather than on facts and scientific evidence. And from that position, like I was just alluding to, it is very tempting to think, oh, we just need more research, more data in order to inform decision makers about the facts so we can avoid the errors of the past and develop better evidence-based policies. That's very much part of the stock narrative of migration researchers these days. But during my career and all the years, I have been talking to policymakers, politicians, and other high-ranking civil servants I more and more came to realize that this is a very naive way of thinking. Because people in policy, in politics, are influenced and constrained by the interests, ideologies, and agendas of their organizations and, and, and their political parties, obviously. And they may just ignore the truth or cherry pick facts and ignore everything that is not convenient. But worse even, they may be actively distorting the truth. For instance, if we think about how Politicians engage in migrant scapegoating or migration fear mongering, um, really the almost irrational fears that are being created for clear political purpose. But more broadly, it reflects a more general lack of scientific grounding, often totally fact free nature of migration debates. 
And the main contention of the paper, which is about to be published uh, in the IMI working paper series, but in a way it's also a spin-off of my book that I just published, How Migration Really Works, is that migration policies often fail to meet their objectives or can even be totally counterproductive, partly because they're not based on a real knowledge of the nature and causes of migration processes. Now, tomorrow I have another talk where I talk more about how things went wrong, for instance, in the United States and why US politicians have been talking for four decades already about the broken immigration system and haven't been able to repair it. That is partly the problem, that a lot of policies actually are not based on a real knowledge. Many policies are geared towards winning the next election, not so much on a real understanding of the phenomenon. So telling just facts is not a solution because the truth gets actively distorted. And it reminded me of a sort of conversation between Edward Said and Noam Chomsky a few decades ago, because Edward Said always argued that the role of the public intellectual is to tell truth to power. And Noam Chomsky, who was sympathetic to that argument, to say, well, they already know the truth. And actually, they're often actively distorting the truth. So is that really the solution? And it is part of the reason why my most recent book is not a book that I wrote for uh, other researchers or politicians, but I wrote it for the big public, basically. I want every citizen to know what we actually know in terms of migration, and we know so much because we talk about a century of migration research. There is a lot of data and knowledge out there. But as I mentioned before, the various misperceptions and myths about migration that are spread by politicians, interest groups, and international organizations, and that the mass media unfortunately uncritically amplify and recycle, reflect institutional agendas, ideologies, or electoral strategies. So it is not so much a lack of knowledge that is haunting us, it is the, the deliberate uh, neglect and the deliberate truth distortion that is going on for electoral guilt. Uh, again, for instance, the well-rehearsed narratives about securing our borders, combating illegal migration, and to viciously crack down on smugglers and traffickers. We have been hearing this for decades, not just in the U e US, but also in Europe. But it's not just about politicians, if I talk about this truth distortion, it is not just about politicians scapegoating migrants and asylum seekers for problems like job, declining job security, wage stagnation, the lack of affordable housing, health care, and so on and so forth. It is also about highly respectable UN agencies like the International Organization for Migration, the United States High Commissioner for Refugees, that emphasize and often exaggerate highest ever increases in migrant and refugee numbers in an, an apparent bid to generate publicity and funding, but which unfortunately add to this idea of this migration invasion. <clears throat> On the pro-migration side, it is also about corporate lobbies that portray migrants as heroes that will stimulate innovation and ensure na that nations retain their competitiveness in the so-called global race for talent. Or pro-immigration groups unrealistically presenting migration as a fix to aging problem. Or development agencies portraying a brain drain as a major cause of development problems such as failure of health care provisions in origin countries. Or climate activists hijacking the migration issue by fabricating and recycling myths about huge wave of climate refugees that are about to crash onto our shores to help make their otherwise completely justified, I want to emphasize that, case for drastically cutting greenhouse gas emissions. So it is not just only fear-mongering right-wing politicians. There's a whole array of actors, let's say both on the left and the right, that have some interest in misrepresenting migration. But it also applies for research. And uh, the research that Carolyn and I and other members of IMI have been criticizing contemporary migration research by being one-sidedly focused on the so-called receiving end of migration. All the debates and research about an almost obsession with immigration, people coming to us, I mean North America, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand. Immigration, integration, racism, identity, these are all very important topics. I don't want to dismiss it. But if we only look at that, we miss the other side of migration, the countries people come from. What are the real causes of migration? 
what are the consequences of migration, both socially, economically, and culturally, from the perspective of the countries migrants come from. And there is a lack of good research and debate about that, but also in the public realm, very simplistic assumptions about what is actually driving migration. I'll get back to that a bit later. So the point is, is that the truth gets distorted on all sides, and even within research, we have quite biased perspectives on migration that miss actually half of the picture, which is the origin country side of the story. So, if we understand how several myths about migration and how many biases are created and are, have, have been persisted because they serve powerful interests and political agendas, it becomes quite naive indeed to think that just facts and myth-busting will do the trick. Because, and this is my own experience, they are simply being ignored. It happened several times to me that I gave talks to high-level policymakers in the UK, in the Netherlands, and that after a talk like this, have some drinks, people would walk up to me and say, that's really interesting, I actually completely agree, but if we would put this into practice, it would be political suicide. I've heard this several times, and to me it shows that, of course, people who deal with migration on a daily basis, if they work for the government, their feet on the ground, basically, uh, border patrol officers know perfectly the truth, and they will also tell you, you cannot stop this, or this is not realistic, but it cannot be expressed politically because it's being seen as, in the US context, weak on immigration or anything like that, or open borders. So people are very afraid to actually talk the truth about immigration, certainly in politics. So it is political suicide, that's why we can implement scientific insights. Politicians lack courage, of course, are driven by the gain for the, for the next elections, but as I was just also explaining, many international organizations, including humanitarian organizations, that seem to be standing on, the, let's say, the good side of the story, often also advocate a lot of misperceptions about migration. So it is not just the misunderstandings, it is really the narratives. So it is not just the facts that will crack those narratives, because the narratives that are being told by all these actors I was just pointing out um, are very powerful stories that are being told about migration, and any fact that goes against that story will either be neglected, ridiculed, or glossed over simply. And that is, of course, problematic. And what I've tried to do in this paper is distinguish four main narratives that we can hear in the public domain about migration. And all of these four narratives, and I'll briefly elaborate on them, all of these four narratives together form a kind of what I call the migration consensus. There are different building blocks. And the four narratives that I'm going to talk about are the mass migration narrative, the first one. The second is the migrant threat narrative, the idea that migration is no threat to destination countries. The third is the migrant victim narrative, which is the way how migrants are often being portrayed. And there is a counter narrative called the migration celebration narrative. And I'll briefly elaborate them and also indicate why they're problematic. And after that, I will tell you something about how I think and what I propose in my book and the paper, how we could move forward to building a different story about migration. Because it's really not just about a fact, it's really an entirely different way, a new paradigm of talking about migration that is grounded in the facts and not into ideology. Let me start with the first sort of narrative, the mass migration narrative. And this is probably the most widely shared idea about national migration, particularly when I talk about so-called South-North migration. So not migration within the United States or between Canada and the United States, but let's say from Latin America, other parts of the world, to the United States or from Africa to Europe, for that matter. And this is the widely shared assumption that international migration is increasing fast as a result of a combination of problems in origin countries like poverty, warfare, inequality, population growth, and climate change. And it's arguably the most powerful of all the four narratives because it directly resonates with deep-seated fears that global migration is spinning out of control because of a series of crises happening in the world. And it resonates with an overall image of South-North migration essentially being a process of people desperately fleeing various sorts of human misery. 
And this amalgamates in this notion of a global migration or refugee crisis. It is almost said in passing by so many people as if this is a fact without actually trying to elaborate on what that crisis is really about. Is this really about numbers or about something else? And also the idea that migration is spinning out of control if we don't do something about it. The notion indeed of America's broken immigration system. And although, let's say the left and the right have very different solutions to this perceived problem, the underlying assumption actually is not so different. This idea, this is something getting out of hand. And let's say, I have to be simplistic, I don't have that much time, but let's say on the right, the solution, the preferred solution is often even more border control, even more border enforcement, even more detention, even more deportation. And let's say on the left, you can hear a different narrative about we need to fix those problems in origin countries, like poverty and violence, so people won't have a reason to flee. I'll get back to that later. Uh, but the underlying assumption of this migration crisis and things running out of hand is actually shared on both sides of that ideological spectrum. Well, if we look at the facts, things get a bit more complicated and that assumption becomes a bit problematic if we look at the actual data. Roughly 3% of the world population is an international migrant right now. 50 years ago, that percentage was similar. 100 years ago, it was probably higher. And many Europeans went indeed to North and South America. Refugees form about one-tenth of all international migrants. So using the previous figure, 0.3% of the world population is a refugee. And more importantly, if you look at long-term trends, there is no increase in Actually, the absolute number of refugees is probably higher with a much smaller world population back in the 1950s. This is not to dismiss problems at the border. And this is not to dismiss problems that migration can create in particular communities where lots of migrants create. But the idea that globally this is kind of spinning out of control is actually not backed up by the facts. And it requires us to think more critically about the nature of migration with the vast majority of people who migrate staying very close to home. Most migrants go to the next country, neighboring country. 80 to 85% of refugees is in neighboring countries. And of course, refugee migration is a huge problem, particularly in the poorest countries of the world. Some of the poorest countries in the world, in Africa and South Asia, are the biggest recipients of refugees, actually not Western countries. So it is not to dismiss a problem, but the overall perception of that the West is being overwhelmed by an increasingly massive tide of refugees is simply not backed by, by evidence. Although politicians are deaf to their truth, in the Netherlands we just had an electoral campaign where the extreme right-wing uh, Freedom Party won the elections based on the presumption that the Netherlands is being completely overwhelmed by asylum seekers. Although if you look at the longer term, it's simply not true, it's a flat line. But that is of course a very strong image. Okay, moving on to the next narrative, that is the migration threat narrative, often combined with the first one. And it portrays migrants as potential job thieves, welfare scroungers, criminals, or worse. And immigration more in general being perceived as an essential threat to the employment, wages, and welfare provisions of local workers, including access to affordable housing uh, and education. And it's often indeed combined with the mass migration narrative. And by the extreme right wing, migration is even being seen as an existential threat. I'm here quoting Suella Braverman, a very prominent conservative politician in the UK, and of course recently Donald Trump with his statements about uh, undocumented migrants poisoning the blood of the nation. So there are softer versions of that. These are the more regular versions about migrants taking jobs and things like that. So you have several gradations. Although it's not only a right-wing discourse, at least until recently, claims that immigrants, immigration is a threat to wages, employment, and labor standards has been a classic stock of trade union discourse. And trade unions have been historically very hostile to the recruitment of migrant workers, also in the US. This has changed recently with unions also in the US abandoning this narrative, and subsequently it has been largely and very successfully taken over. But that narrative has shifted political camp, but it is still there. 
Well, again, I highlight this also in my book, there is simply no evidence that migrants take away jobs, migrants come to fill vacancies, that migration drives down wages. Also, there is no evidence. Actually, a lot of research that shows, looks at the impact of immigration on crime, suggests that high immigrant neighborhoods actually have lower crime rates. But anyway, effects are very small. There is no big case to be made with all these arguments. Although it is true that the already affluent benefit more from immigration than local workers on low wages who often don't benefit much from immigration and are, on, are confronted with the day-to-day -day consequences of immigration, which are not always positive, of course this threat narrative is not backed up by any facts. The third narrative, and it is a slightly more humanitarian and perhaps more attractive and more compelling sounding argument, particularly to those on the left, liberals, progressive, is this idea that migrants are victims, particularly when we talk about migrants from poor countries moving to rich countries. But sometimes it reinforces the true previous narratives, and it largely depicts migration as a desperate flight from misery. Whether we talk about boat migration across the Mediterranean or the English Channel, or the so-called caravans, on their way to the United States, through Central America. It portrays migrants and also refugees as victims of merciless smugglers, traffickers, and in the end of the day, and exploitative employers. It tends also to represent organized crime and deceit as the principal cause of South North migration, feeding into stereotypical images of migrants and refugees being tricked or rounded up by smugglers and traffickers as if they would almost force them to make those journeys, subject them to severe abuse, and once having reached the destination, force them to work in slavery-like conditions. And this narrative feeds in the policy idea that we can solve these problems if we rescue migrants and refugees from the stranglehold of smugglers and traffickers. It leads to ideas about a war on immigration, cracking down on smugglers, quite analogous to the war on drugs, for instance. And other ideas often are, we need to inform migrants and refugees about the dangers, based on the presumption that once migrants will know those dangers, they wouldn't be coming anymore. Others have proposed, indeed, development aid as one way to prevent this from happening. I have to be very careful here. This is, again, not to deny that many migrants are subject to deceit and exploitation, and horrible things happen to too many migrants and refugees. It is a highly biased perspective that is simply not representative to the overall experience, but more importantly, it denies agency to migrants, particularly their ability to think for themselves. The whole idea that people would just keep on coming without having a good reason for coming, for instance, job opportunities, or a real threat for their security or lives even, is implicitly based on quite colonial assumptions about the need of the non-white other to be informed and civilized what is in their own best interest, as if potential migrants from poor countries cannot think for themselves. And it is a task of Western governments that finance all these organizations like the IOM to inform migrants about what's better for them. And it denies, more importantly, evidence that in general migration is a rational decision and that most migrants have a lot to gain from migration, even if they're being exploited. This is from my own research in Morocco and lots of research I've done in Mexico and Turkey and other origin countries. Picking up a job, if you're Moroccan, for instance, you go to Spain, even if you're an undocumented migrant, you can earn six, seven, eight times more an hour than you'd be able to make in Morocco. And a Moroccan employer wouldn't necessarily exploit you less. But when I talk to young Moroccans, they say it's a no-brainer, even if I'm not documented. And when I was in Ciudad Juarez in El Paso last year, same stories. People talk about job opportunities. So the idea that just by telling them there's nothing there, it won't happen, it will still happen, and otherwise migration would not continue. Migration is very much driven by real opportunities. It also goes along with the false representation of smuggling. Smugglers, particularly politicians, tend to portray smuggling as the cause of illegal migration. Whereas, again, if you talk to migrants, most will tell you, well, 
I do hire that smuggler to be able to cross their border without being caught by criminals or abusive state agents. Yeah, it's illegal. It's an illegal business, an illegal business that is not being controlled. So deceit does happen. But we also know from very good research on smuggling by anthropologists in particular who talk to smugglers, is that most smugglers are small-scale operators, not large-scale cartels. The idea that the Mexican cartels drive undocumented migration to the US is simply false. Gabriela Sanchez, a quite well-known Mexican um, uh, migration researcher based in El Paso, will always tell in her publications that most smugglers are direct family members of migrants, often ex-migrants, often women and even children. These are not generally international mafias. And migrants are willing to pay for their service to cross borders legally. And in a way, it's a response to border enforcement. Because the more border enforcement, migrants will rely more on their smugglers. So this is not necessarily a good news story or a positive story. But the idea that just by cracking down on the border, by increasing border enforcement, you will then have less smuggling. No, it's the other way around. The more you crack down on immigration, the more dependent migrants become on using smugglers across borders. So migrants generally know what they're doing. Of course, migrants also make errors of judgment. Of course, there are migrants who are not well informed and being deceived. And of course, there is uh, all the re reason to protect migrants from those abuses. But the idea generally, this is a desperate flight for misery, is simply not backed up by the evidence. Let me now turn to the pro-immigration narrative, which I call the migration celebration narrative. It turns almost all of the arguments upside down of the migration threat narrative in particular. And that narrative put its hope on migration to address a whole range of problems, such as labor shortages, economic stagnation, and population aging in destination countries. It casts migrants not as a threat, but as beacons of hope to revitalize societies, boost growth, innovation, and trade. And it's indeed a complete counter-narrative of the migration threat narrative, particularly popular amongst libertarians, liberals, and pro-business think tanks, but also organizations like the World Bank, for instance. This is the argument that we need immigrants, very popular amongst economists, who argue that freer migration will boost productivity and wealth, not just in destination countries, but also in poor countries, because migrants send money back home, and it is much higher amount of money than development aid, and this is bottom-to-bottom -bottom development aid, and families back home are, are um, able to improve their living standards and even invest that money in home country development. So it all seems like a win-win-win for destination countries, for origin countries, and for migrants themselves. And this is the classic open border argument. Just open the border, things will be fine. We don't have to fear. What I find interesting is that pro-immigration business lobbies actually are forming a strange bedfellow coalition here with left-wing liberals and progressives celebrating racial and ethnic diversity as something inherently good. So in a way, on both sides of the ideological divide, you'll find pro-immigration voices. I find that quite curious. How does that really fit together? Well, it's a different debate. This narrative, although again, I mean, most of these narratives contain some elements of the truth. Also, this one contains some elements of the truth, but again, it is very biased. It has very strong corporate undertones. We know from research, I was mentioning it before, for instance, econometric research that looks at the impact of immigration on wages. There is no good evidence to argue that immigration is driving down wages of low income earners because it's rather that. Migrants fill up vacancies that the natives no longer want to fill up. But it is also true that those owning the businesses and using the services of migrants in particular, and here I'm talking about higher middle class households, are the main beneficiaries of immigration. And those having their you know, pensions saved in um, all sorts of stocks that are invested in those corporations, they benefit from immigration. Anyway, it's understandable that the main economic benefits of migration go to the already affluent in society. Whereas the lowest income earning groups don't benefit economically from migration at all, and in some cases, even 
see their wages slightly going down. This is not massive. It cannot explain the 40 years of wage stagnation in the US. Uh, but it's understandable from that perspective that people say, what's in it for me? Because these are exactly also the populations that see the day-to-day -day consequences of immigration in the neighborhoods and in the workforce. And often these are ex-migrants. And we know that ex-migrants are often the strongest opponents against new migrants coming. And economically, there's a logic to it because they often do the jobs where you can create real competition for more migrants coming in. What I'm trying to say is that it is understandable that there is a critique on this narrative being a quite corporate narrative that doesn't look at the non-economic side of migration. And also internationally, you can argue, yeah, it is okay that migrants send money back to their origin country, but we also know that most of the benefits of the labor and the knowledge that migration brings goes to wealthy countries that attract migrants. So I hope I convinced you that all four of those narratives are problematic. Often they are put together in what I call in my paper the new migration consensus because the different narratives are selectively applied for different groups of migrants. The migration celebration narrative is selectively applied for the so-called expat, higher skilled migrants that we all want. And you can see that translated into policy. Not many people realize that Legal temporary migration in the US has really increased really fast over the last decades from roughly 2 million a year in the Clinton years, I think, reaching an all time high under Trump, 6 million a year. Then we had the slump in COVID, but it's now back to 5 to 6 million a year temporary admissions to the United States. That's the same for the European Union, but it's primarily about legal migration. This is not what you see in the narratives of politicians. This is just about legal admissions going up for temporary jobs. And here we talk about higher skilled workers, specialists, doctors, nurses, teachers, academics, engineers, um, intra-company transferees, and of course, international students. They're the good migrants in the narrative. The bad migrants are the lower skilled, particularly when they're non-white, migrants coming in from non-European origin countries, then it becomes more problematic. And these are often the migrants that are being portrayed and including refugees as the threat, as the problematic group. That's a very selective way of talking about immigration. And it is deeply problematic. I don't have that much time to elaborate on, on it here. But of course, we all know, and I hope to get an opinion piece out next week or so in the Wall Street Journal, where I say what all these narratives ignore and also in the current debate in the US, with this new bill probably going to be killed in the Senate. Now, if it passes the Senate, it will be killed probably in the House. I don't know whether you're aware, but there's a major immigration bill tied to uh, other issues, support for Ukraine, for instance. Um, what those narratives don't mention is the real demand for lower skill workers. Number of vacancies in the US are at an all time high. Unemployment is at a 50-year low in the United States. Everybody knows, this is kind of an open secret, that although very few legal channels exist for lower-skilled migrants doing all those jobs in agriculture, in construction, in a whole range of services, cleaning, um, care jobs, and so on and so forth, um, are still coming. And whoever enters the United States is able to find jobs. And this is largely tolerated. It is a truth that is not being told in reality, but it is a real truth. And it's the same in Europe. So there's a lot of anti-immigration narratives that says, well, we need those expat workers. They're highly welcome. Whoever wants to come and get a visa, wherever you come from. Doctors and engineers and academics are welcome, but we don't need those other workers. That is obviously a lie. And we know it i going to talk about it more in another talk tomorrow. If you look at labor enforcement, for instance. Although the Justice Department didn't want to release the data, Syracuse University has used the Freedom of Information Act, is that the right name? To get data on the actual numbers of employers that is being prosecuted in the US for employing undocumented migrants. I was shocked when I read the actual number. 2015, without any zeros added. Year. Now that's in the range of the chance of being hit by lightning. And it shows a huge political hypocrisy around this issue. And that the narratives that portrays 
lowest skilled non-white workers coming from Mexico, Central America, Haiti, Western Africa, that all find work in the United States and their work is largely tolerated, don't fit into this narrative, but of course the reality is a very different one. Okay, let me stop here. Not with my talk. But let me, I hope what I'm trying to convey is that the problem is not the facts, but because we know the facts. And the facts tell a much more complex and nuanced story about immigration, which is neither pro or anti. The problem is the narrative. The narratives that we now have, the four ones I um, just was elaborating, fit into this sort of pro, anti, good, bad migrant sort of narratives that create a very simplistic idea about migration. We need a different narrative. We need a different paradigm in immigration. In the last part of my talk, I will focus on that because that's a good question. Researchers can say the whole time what is wrong <laughs> and uh, all these myths, we can bust all those myths, but of course we also have um, the obligation to at least sketch how we could think about migration differently. If we agree that all those narratives are deeply problematic, uh, we need to show, we need to expose how we can face, say things, how we can talk about migration in a different way. Yes, we need a new narrative. We need to promote an entirely new way of talking about migration. And that is exactly what we've been trying at the International Migration Institute. And in our recent publications and in my new book, I'm really trying to push it to really show how we can talk about migration in a different way. Now let's start with the most basic of statements. Migration is, of course, of all times. People have always moved. We are all migrants, or at least if we go a few generations back, we are all migrants. And this is perhaps a cliche, but I think it is a time, it's time that we take that cliche very seriously. Also, if we talk about a more scientifically grounded way of talking about migration. And at the risk of talking myself out of business as a migration researcher, do we really need more data and research? It's always nice to know more, but we already know so much. I don't think that's actually the key problem. It is very standard for research to say we need more data and research. What I found so frustrating is that everything I know and what we know from a century of migration research across the social sciences, there's this wealth of data and books and articles. We know so much, but it doesn't reach the general public. And I already exposed why I'm so cynical about informing politicians or powerful international organizations that will simply ignore things that are not convenient and don't fit into those narratives. So facts are not going to save us. We need our own stories. We need to develop our own stories. We need to put them in a public realm to, in a way, force a different story through to the public domain so people start to think more critically about what they're being told by politicians and to the media. We need a scientifically grounded paradigm on migration that is not only backed up by facts, but tells indeed a different story. So now you will ask me, what is then that new paradigm? First of all, it is not a paradigm that portrays migration either as a problem to be solved or as a solution to problems, because that is basically how you could summarize those four narratives. It is a paradigm that is holistic. It's still a very abstract word. What do I mean with it? It is a perspective that sees migration as an intrinsic part of much broader processes of change and social transformation happening in the world, in origin, and in destination countries. And this starts from the premise that we can and should not analytically separate migration from other processes of change because it is part of change itself, migration. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. But this perspective restores and synthesizes much older intellectual traditions in migration studies, but also in development studies more generally. And this comes with a very different understanding of migration. And let me give a few examples. I think the most compelling example is perhaps urbanization. We all know that over the last 200 years or so, with industrialization, people have massively moved from rural to urban areas. Mechanization of agriculture combined with all sorts of other changes, industrialization, led to this large-scale transfer of 
labor, economic activities, and also people from the rural to the urban. Now, much is written about urbanization, and particularly in developing countries, many development agencies have tried to stop rural to urban migration, which if you look at the European or North American experience, is a bit of a naive thing, because urbanization, whether you like it or not, is part of that what we often see as development, you know? The move out of traditional agricultural sub societies to a modern industrial society where even most people live in rural areas no longer depend on agriculture. And young people generally tend to move to cities. The point is that you cannot conceptualize urbanization without thinking about migration. But the other way around, you cannot conceptualize mass migration without thinking about urbanization. Both phenomena are intrinsically intertwined, it's the same process. So just the idea, there have been efforts by development agencies to stop urbanization. And the classic example is to build the proverbial road to the rural area. A lot of research suggests that it actually speeds up urbanization, because it facilitates people to move to the city. This is not to say that urbanization is always positive and never comes with its downsides. The point is more that this is actually inevitable. If you want so-called modernization and industrialization, which is often in the development plans, and Carolyn has done research on the effect of education on migration, because the idea is you build schools in rural areas, so people no longer have to migrate. But what often happens once people go to school, they no longer want to be farmers, and they tend to pursue higher education where? In urban areas. And where are they going to find jobs? In urban areas. This is perhaps the most powerful explanation why Migration is not the antithesis of development. It is development, as Ronald Skelton, a very prominent migration researcher, has argued. Another example is the idea I was already alluding to, which you can often hear on the left. We need to help poor countries to become richer, better educated, provide more opportunities, develop infrastructure, so people no longer have the need to migrate. That sounds very compelling and intuitive, and it fits within the sort of push-pull kind of framework. It is problematic, though, if we look at the evidence that shows that, by and large, development in poor countries leads to more migration. It is no coincidence that the most important emigration countries in the world are not the poorest countries in the world. Until very recently, it was Mexico for the United States. If you look at Europe, you look at Turkey. Other countries I could cite as India, the Philippines. These are not the poorest countries in the world. Why is that the case? Because migration is actually not, in general, a desperate flight for misery, certainly not over long distances, because migration is expensive. And by and large, migration is an investment in a better future that requires a lot of resources. Not just the money to travel, or if you're an irregular migrant, to pay a smuggler, but also to get a certain degree that helps you to get a visa and a work permit for a destination country. The best educated immigrant group in the US are Sub-Saharan Africans. Most Sub-Saharan Sub Africans are too poor to move out of that region of the world. You only make it if you are either win the lottery, the visa lottery, or if you're very highly skilled. Then you'll probably be able to pick up a job. Or if you come from a rich family that can afford your education in the United States. And that explains why migration development leads to more migration from rural to urban, and internationally, and only when countries really become rich, and Mexico seems to be on that trajectory because Mexico is moving into becoming a high-income country, immigration tails, tends to tail off. So we see a non-linear pattern. Let me not get too scientific. The point is more that, again, if all those processes are starting to occur, increasing incomes, better infrastructure, better education, just to pick a few, more people tend to go on and move, primarily within countries to urban areas, but also internationally. So it's a very different story than you'd hear normally. Migration is a resource. And these are just a few examples I'm giving here that we really need a different way of talking about migration. Not as a solution to problems, not as a problem to be solved because we can, of course, not solve migration. It is part of the human experience. People have always moved. We need to understand how changes in society, economically, socially, politically, lead to different forms of mobility. And from there we can say something more fundamental. And perhaps the most ignored 
side of migration, if we talk about drivers, because what you hear in the political scene also in the US is solutions are being perceived as more border enforcement or helping countries in Central America or Haiti or other countries. What nobody talks about, and I was kind of alluding to it before, is the labor demand factor. Most migrants simply wouldn't have come without that pool, that labor demand, and those real opportunities that are there. Anyway, what I've shared with you is not meant as the final word. Much work remains to be done. But I think at the most fundamental level, whatever approach we choose, the fundamental requirement of a holistic migration paradigm is to conceptualize migration as a normal process, as an inevitable part of the change that the world experienced in the past, is experiencing right now, and will experience in the future. And how it is inextricably linked and embedded in larger processes of change. And understanding this fundamental normalcy of migration will lead us to a totally new way of thinking about human mobility. A new paradigm on the very nature and causes of migration would be like most things which we are usually told on the subject. And last but not least, I think it is also important that we reach out beyond the academe. That is my main worry, that we are forming an internal conversation, and people may agree on many things within the academe, but we haven't excelled, I think, in providing a link between what we know in the academe and the public domain. And I think social scientists should work much harder, including myself, to also being a bridge and telling different stories to a much bigger audience than an inner circle of um, intellectuals, and that we probably need to do our best to talk plain English whatever other language we may be writing in, to provide that bridge between academia and the public debate. Thank you very much. So we do have a few questions online already. So if you guys have any questions, just raise your hand. I'll bring the mic um, so that those participating hybrid can hear your question. Um, the first one is from Marta online. She says, hello from Cambridge, UK. Does Professor de Haas feel optimistic about the international efforts under the Global Compact for Migration? Or is it the same old narrative and assumption about migration recycled under a new form? That is a very good question. Um, I've, I, I, to be really honest, when I read about the Global Compact, I think it's still largely, by and large, based on the narratives we know. Although, I think it is very good that there is a forum where origin and destination countries talk. So I see it more as a long-term diplomatic process. But I think there's a long way to go before that new perspective is being adopted. Because even those kind of initiatives are still, I think, primarily dominated by the interests of rich countries. Um, and it's to sort of focus on control of mobility. And I think there's a danger. There is a paradox that it seems logical to think the more I control migration or the more I put limits on migration, the less people will come. But we often ignore historical experiences of so-called free migration where that actually never happened. So this, I understand why states are focused on controlling because there's a clear political incentive and the fear of being seen as weak. And uh, just look at the US debate. But I still think we need a breakthrough. So what I see is a gradual change. And that these ideas gradually find their way. But this sort of new way of thinking of migration, I see it coming. But when I look at the global compact, I think it is still too much dominated by the interests of wealthy destination states. And we really need that balance, I think. And of course, it reflects a huge power imbalance in terms of funding and who's being able to push through the narratives. And still, by and large, the narratives of the global north are very dominant. And what I also see, they're being taken over by some developing countries. Um, for instance, if you look within Africa, some destination countries within Africa, like Nigeria or South Africa, or Cote d'Ivoire, or Morocco, are adopting similar xenophobic narratives. And it seems that this power of the narrative is so strong that also politicians in non-Western countries 
using them now to frame items as a set of thread. So you can only change that if the overall narrative changes. So I don't have an easy answer to that really good question. I think, on the other hand, I think it is good, and I've seen that myself, if there is at least a global dialogue, at least people talk to each other. So I think ultimately, uh, these insights hopefully will change also the way we look at migration. Less focused on control and more focused on understanding mobility. Thank you very much for, for I mean, something that uh, many of us that uh, come from other places or that deal with issues of migration in, in ways and forms are think uh, along your lines. And I think that distinction between human mobility vis-a-vis -vis migration is a, a really good one. <clears throat> because as you presented it, migration uh, encompasses everything, right? And migration is not one thing, but multiple uh, uh, manifestations of pressures over communities, individuals, societies, uh, whatever, right? There are economic drivers, there are uh, uh, security drivers, there are climate change, I mean, there are a plethora of drivers uh, that put people in, 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 on, on the move, right? And of course, uh, the first dimension is uh, internal mobility, internal migration, internal displacement, uh, neighboring displacement, uh, that, that sometimes account for these numbers, but is not really what we are talking about when we talk about migration. One thing is refugees, one thing is, is uh, uh, displacement by you know, crime-related issues, political activities, uh, education. Many of us came to this country to be educated. Some of us stay, some others not. But there is a plethora of things, and I, I, I really applaud your, your, your taking to, uh, to think about mobility in a more like, proactive way and uh, try to take away this label migration as everything that encompasses uh, human mobility. Um, the challenge is how to approach this uh, within particular discourses of human mobility, right? Uh, and I think uh, you are giving us some clues, uh, but I wanna ask you particularly about one, about uh, the new uh, label of climate refugees. How do you uh, think about it? Uh, in which terms, how you can uh, uh, help uh, be productive on this, on this dimension? Thank you. Um, I have huge problems with the concept of climate migration. I, I have a background in environmental geography, and that also perhaps explains the worries I have. What I see let me first say climate change is real. It's going to be a huge problem. It's going to create huge challenges, particularly for the poorest in the world that are often dependent on agrarian income and that will be the biggest victims of climate change, the negative effects of climate change. But linking this to migration is tricky because scientifically we have as many reasons to assume that deprivation as a result of climate change will lead to more or less mobility. That is exactly the cause of the new, I welcome your um, ideas about mobility because I couldn't agree more that we need to expand our notion about the movement of people beyond migration to have a more mobility paradigm. But if, particularly if you think about mobility as a fundamental freedom, as a resource, and mobility perhaps not even as the freedom, not necessarily about movement per se, but philosophically, you may, for instance, say that mobility freedom is really about the freedom to choose where to live, including the option to stay at home. Because you're only a free migrant if you had the option to stay at home. So it becomes a fundamental freedom. I sometimes compare it to political freedom. Now we all know that we of freedom of expression. So the awareness we have those political freedoms of freedom of expression gives us intrinsic well-being because we know we are able to speak out one day if we need to. We, are able, we know we can vote if we want to, and we know we can run for office if we want to, even if many people will never do it. The moment that freedom is being taken away, we may go out in the street. 
But once your country has become democratic, and we know this from a lot of research, a few election cycles later, many people may not even bother to vote because people take it for granted they have that freedom. Same for mobility freedoms. What's been observed by many migration researchers is that in countries where it is difficult to migrate to another country because of immigration restrictions, people get obsessed with getting out. Whereas in countries where there's basically an open border, people are not so busy with migration because they know, well, if I really don't like it anymore, if something bad happens, I can move out. But moving out is a resource because it, we often see it as a desperate flight, but it, it's costly, it comes with resources. And from that reasoning, and it's actually backed up by some evidence, for instance, that looked, uh, from that reasoning, I need to finish my sentence. From that reasoning, the assumption that the negative consequences of climate change will necessarily lead to more people moving needs to be questioned. For instance, we know from some research on the effect of droughts on mobility in several African countries that during dry years, long distance mobility went down, not up. Why? Because mobility requires resources. So for poor households in Mali who wanted to migrate to Burkina, to, uh, not to Burkina Faso, to uh, Cote d'Ivoire, which is a regional destination, didn't have the resources to do it. So more people went actually, and they had a better harvest and more resources. This is not to say that climate change will not lead to people having to leave their homelands or, or their, their native places. I don't want to dismiss that. Of course, that's a huge issue, but we also have reasons to assume that will be primarily short distance mobility and often temporary. But that the biggest victims of climate change will be those who get trapped, who are not able to move out. And these are generally the poorest populations. I think some comparison to Hurricane Katrina, we know what populations were hit most by Hurricane Katrina and where the, um, the damage, and also in terms of, of, of victims, uh, people who died during the Hurricane Katrina, were overwhelmingly low-income African-American households, without the connections, without cars often, that disabled them to get out. So we may return the whole analysis around, but say, although climate change is probably is the biggest challenge facing humankind in the next half a century, and it can create dangerous tipping points, but the biggest victims, paradoxically, of climate change will be those who cannot move out because migration mobility is a resource. It helps you not just to survive, but improves your future. What I'm trying to say is that there's still a lot of research to be done on this, but the first thing I think we can be relatively certain about is that what we read in the newspaper about hundreds of millions of people crossing the international border I think most experts on this issue already agree that it's simply no basis for that. That most mobility will be short distance. It could still mean that people lose everything. But to link climate change to mass migrations and fears of mass migration to uh, wealthy nations is deeply problematic. Now, Carolyn knows much more about it. Don't you want to say something? <laughs> but we can talk about it for a long time, but I think that the, the broader mobility notion and the idea that mobility is a resource and can enable people to flee situations of danger. And the same for warfare, right? I mean, one of the reasons that refugee migration from Syria was much higher than from Yemen is that most Syrians were wealthier than most Yemenis. And many Yemenis cannot escape their country. They're trapped in immobility, as we call it, immobility studies. And, and, and we don't read about it, and that's why we don't see it as a problem. Of course, the problem is perhaps even bigger in countries where people cannot get out of those situations. Again, mobility then not becomes this act of desperation. It's, it's a move forward. But you need resources to do that. I hope that answers your question. So we've got, we'll squeeze in one more question. Um, I want to thank everybody again online for joining us. This, and this will be quick. <laughs> um, Thanks for, thanks for this. This is a very important topic. I, I love it. But I have, I have only one question. Um, I understand here in, here in America, there were Ukrainians came over in, in thousands. And you were, you were speaking about the uh, people in Katrina. And they, when they were uh, moved along from after the, after the environmental flood that they had, they were put into trailers and given $2,500 debit cards from FEMA. Uh, 
to live on. And a lot of those people are still in living in trailers or maybe some have gone on. But my question to you is, do you think each nation approves of who they want, who they want to uh, cater to when people are migrating to that particular country? Do they say, okay, we, we will, if these people are migrating, we will help them and we'll give them aid. But we do not want these particular people uh, coming into the country. Definitely. I mean, the case of Ukrainians also in Europe, I think, is a very good one. Because in Europe, the narrative was very much like there's simply too many refugees. So politicians try to objectify. What I see is a lack of political will to receive refugees. But when the Ukrainians came, certainly in Europe, these were much bigger numbers than any other refugee group that came, for instance, to the Netherlands. Suddenly, they were welcome. So suddenly not construct as a problem. And that to me shows it was not about numbers, it was really about who is coming. And that issues like race may play a very, very big role while one group, which was quantitatively way smaller than migrant groups from the Middle East or Africa, refugees, are seeing as portrayed as bogus asylum seekers, fake refugees and whatever. And when Ukrainians came, they were suddenly massively welcome. So what we see is that states are highly selective indeed in what migrants are fit in and are welcome and which not. So I couldn't agree more. And it even applies indeed for catering uh, for internally displaced people, which also in Mexico, for instance, is a huge issue. And, and those people are often not catered for by their own governments, who may indeed welcome other groups coming in. And it, of course, race and ethnicity plays a huge role if you want to explain this. And I think the Ukrainian case in Europe actually proved it. Because suddenly we didn't hear about numbers anymore. A lot of numbers were way higher. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you.